Today we look at the Oregon State spring game and all the latest headlines coming out of Corvallis with the football program and head coach Jonathan Smith. Let's go. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster. Thanks for making this your first listen or your first view if you're watching on YouTube every day. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, free and available on all platforms. Thank you in advance for liking and subscribing wherever you are listening to and or watching the show right now. This episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see that I'm not alone on today's podcast. Brought in our resident Beaver expert here on Locked On Pac 12, making his inaugural appearance, Carter Baines, senior writer and editor at BeaverBlitz.com. Carter, welcome to Locked On Pac 12. Yeah, thanks for having me. Getting ready to uh, to talk some football here. We're about what a week and a half removed from from spring ball at Oregon State, so still kind of fresh in my mind a little bit before we before we really dive into the off season here. Yeah, I wanted to pick your brain about uh, a couple of things, and let's start with big takeaways. You know, from from the spring game itself and spring football writ large. The defense was the biggest thing that held Oregon State back last year. Anyone who watched the Beavers knew that. You know, they, they finished at seven and five. They are seven and six with with the bowl game, and the, the defense was the reason they didn't win eight or nine because that offense scored a lot of points and. They've done a good job of doing that. Jonathan Smith has them moving in the right direction, but defensively is where they need the most help, and they made a change in their defensive coordinator role in the offseason with Trent Bray taking over. He was on staff, but he's now the full-time defensive coordinator. So what's kind of the latest there on the defensive side of the ball and how Oregon State is looking on defense? Well, I think the change that they made there is it's big in that um, – one of, one of Oregon State's biggest weaknesses, as you mentioned over the last couple of years, has been its defense and particularly on the front seven. And, you know, the inability to get pressure on the quarterback and, mm-hmm. and stop the run at the line of scrimmage um, has held this team back from from winning, you know, eight or nine games last year or to getting to a bowl game in 2019. Um, and so to make that change and, and to bring in somebody who's kind of going to change things up as far as schematics go and and, you know, the way they're going to approach the, you know, the, the day to day, more aggressive style, um, you know, more, more blitzing on, on game days. Um, that's a way that you can overcome any personnel deficiencies that you have, which is something that I think we're still seeing at Oregon state, you know, a, a lack of depth on the defensive line, some questions about who might start at outside linebacker. Um, I, I think a lot of that in the spring I saw become overcome by, a more aggressive scheme. And I, I think with Trent Bray at the helm, we're going to see that in the regular season as well. And, and schematics are, are part of beating, being a good coordinator or a good coach in college football. But sometimes you just have to have the players. I was talking about this with, with regards to, to USC and UCLA earlier this week, because their defenses have struggled in the last couple of years. You need a guy who can call the X's and O's and, and dial up the, the right coverages and the right play calls at the right time. But sometimes you just have to have playmakers. You know, maybe you're out there calling a, a base defense because the other side is going hurry up. Sometimes you need a guy who can just win a one on one and get after the quarterback. So I, I've at least from what I have read, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but heard a lot of optimism on the defensive front with regards to the schematics as you were talking about. But for Beaver fans, is there any hope for change in the recruiting standpoint and the sort of players they could bring in either from high school or in the transfer portal? You would hope so. I mean, the coaching staff is very aware that this needs to be addressed. You know, it's been a, a point of emphasis every offseason, you know, targeting guys in the transfer portal, um, scouring the high school ranks. And they've mostly swung and missed as far as the front seven goes um, in the transfer portal recently. 
particularly on the D-line, because, I mean, you can look back, and Avery Roberts came in via transfer portal. Uh, Andrew Chatfield is going to be a big-time contributor this year. Um, but those guys are linebackers. You know, Oregon State hasn't brought in really anybody on the line, um, and that's something that's going to need to change because, quite frankly, I, I don't think you're going to stop very many teams in this conference if you don't have a couple of big bodies on on the line who can, you know, who are – are good enough to start on on most teams. I think if you look at the projected two deep for Oregon State, you would say, man, these def- defensive linemen would be backups on on pretty much every other team in this conference, and it's been that way for a couple of years. So, I don't know. D tackle in particular is it's a very tough position to recruit, particularly out west where the talent pool is smaller. Um, but the fact that Oregon State has swung and missed so many times. It's it's obviously concerning. One of the swings and misses they had most notably in the last several weeks here on the recruiting trail was not on the defensive side, but was also on, on the offensive side. They were in pursuit of JT Daniels, who's been on, I think, 12, 13 different teams now at this point in his college career. I don't know. I've lost track, but he leaves Georgia and he was at USC. And I feel like there were three other schools there in, in the like anyway. Oregon State was going after him, and they didn't end up landing him, and he certainly would have been the leading candidate to beat out Chance Nolan for the starting quarterback position. But where does that where does that position group stand right now without JT Daniels after they went after him pretty hard? Well, I mean, we can start with kind of looking at where they're at right now. You've got three scholarship guys on campus right now and Chance Nolan, who obviously started last year and had a pretty good season in his first year as the uh, as the full time guy. Tristan Jebby is also back and he's healthy after recovering from that hamstring tear and ensuing surgery um, that that side sidelined him all year last year. And then Ben Branson, a true freshman who has one drive of playing experience in his career. Um, you know, that's that's not a very deep group. That's that's all you have as far as scholarship guys go. Travis Throckmorton will come in this fall, and then they'll also have a walk-on in Dom Montiel, who I'm actually pretty high on as well. Um, so things will start to look a little deeper come fall. But I think had they been able to bring in JT Daniels, obviously that's a guy who is probably going to start day one. You know, I, I don't know if he would have been guaranteed the job coming in, uh, but I, I don't think there's any way he comes to Oregon State and doesn't start. Um, and I had said during the recruiting process of, you know, his his transfer recruiting process, JT Daniels comes to Oregon State. I think this is a Pac-12 North champion team. I, I think they're that close to getting over the hump that all they needed was, you know, a, a top two, top three quarterback in this conference to to make that leap and and really start to compete at the highest level in, in the Pac-12. Yeah, and, and Daniels, I think, would have fit in that scheme really really well because he's not a particularly mobile guy but that's not jonathan smith's mo it wasn't when he was at washington where he had a lot of success as the oc when jake browning was there and just the way that he you know much more pro style you know the way that offenses look on sundays now you don't have to be a supremely mobile guy whereas you know, an RPO based attack or Chip Kelly's offense at UCLA, you're going to have a quarterback who, who needs, needs to be able to move a little bit more. You also need to have some pass protection in front of him and a capable run game. And to need to do that, you need a quality offensive line, which I'll ask you about after I tell you all about Bet Online. You are number one source for all your sports betting stats and sports info this year. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, including basketball playoffs and start of the Major League Baseball season. Go Mariners, by the way. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, Carter. So the offensive line is the hallmark of any offense. You, you, you have to at least be competent up there if you're going to do anything. If your line's no good, you can't run the ball and then you can't do play action. That's a huge part of what Jonathan Smith wants to do it is the play action game and they've had a lot of success with that particularly i've seen with their tight ends over the last couple of years but what is the beavers offensive line looking like right now after a season ago that they were a part of, of the offense being very productive well if you remember to a year ago this was arguably the best offensive line in the country um, i think the only other offensive line that you could look to to say that oh yeah they are definitely better is is michigan 
Um, Oregon State was one of four finalists for the Joe Moore Award, which goes annually to the top offensive line in the country. Uh, and the statistics back it up. I mean, Oregon State was one of the most prolific rushing offenses. They gave up sacks and tackles for loss at a rate essentially unmatched by anybody in the Pac-12. Um, and that's really impressive considering about two, three years ago, uh, we were talking about this Oregon State offensive line as being the weakness of the team. So what Jim Mahalachuk has been able to do there as the posi position coach to recruit guys that he likes, that he's able to develop, um, to, you know, to to kind of build them up as guys who can play at multiple positions, uh, to build depth there, I, I think has been one of the more impressive things um, that I've seen throughout this four, now five-year rebuild at Oregon State. Um, what what comes back this year, obviously, you're losing, you're losing the best piece of, of your offensive line last year in Nathan Eldridge, who was a two-time All-Pac-12 first-team guy uh, at, at center, and then Nuske Abunum, who had been on the team for five, six, seven years, uh, and who had been, you know, a, a really reliable guy in the middle of that line as well. Those are two guys that are going to be really tough to replace. Um, but I, I, I think this offensive line is actually primed for an, another pretty big year. Uh, Marco Brewer and uh, Taliesa Fuaga were the two guys that I see stepping in for uh, the two that are gone. And they both got a decent amount of playing time last year as well. So they were key contributors on uh, a line that was easily the best in the Pac-12. Um, and so I, I don't really see things dropping off too much, to be honest with you. The only concern I would have would be the depth behind that starting group. Uh, but as long as everyone's healthy, I, I think it has the potential to, to lead another really prolific running game. And I, I think, assuming Chance Nolan's the guy at quarterback, he's going to have all day to operate again. Quarterback's best friend is, what is that old expression, Card Ah, oh, running game. Yes, 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 that's right. And the Beavers have done that very, very well. And I, I think that the, the growth that Nolan showed playing quarterback last year, even though he wasn't expected to be the starter coming in, he wasn't at the beginning, and then he uh, took over the job, and I thought performed pretty darn well. I mean, you're part of a rebuilding program. You win seven games. That's a, a pretty solid season. Part of the reason I think he was able to you know, start to improve over the course of the year and have some really nice moments is because he was upright a lot and because Oregon State ran the ball very well. And so he could get those easy in rhythm throws on on, on play action sequences. Right. And so if they can do that again and and Trent Bray can improve the defense, I think the Beavs can certainly be a contender in the Pac-12. North. I mean, I think people kind of forget that they were in the mix a season ago. It was Oregon who, who ended up victorious because they beat the Beavs at the end of the year. And then Washington State was there and Oregon State was there. And there was a scenario there with uh, one or two weeks ago in the regular season where Oregon State could have done that. So if they can make those those subtle sorts of improvements, then I, I think contending in the North is some, is a reasonable expectation for Beaver fans. Yeah, and, and that's kind of why I said if they landed JT Daniels, I would go ahead and predict them preseason to win the North. That's just, I felt like they were so close to getting there last year that they're one or two pieces away uh, from getting over that hump. And I, I think right now it's, you know, it's, it's the defense. It's if they can show enough improvement on the front seven, if they can improve their pocket pressure, uh, that's the kind of thing that can get them one or two more wins. And last year, that would have been the difference between finishing third in the North and going to Vegas to represent the, the division. So I, I think, you know, the excitement around the program hasn't necessarily been at an all-time high recently. You know, there hasn't been any, like, big-time news or anything that's come out throughout the spring. But I think once the team kind of comes back in the fall and we ramp up towards the season again, Oregon State fans are going to be really excited about the product uh, that Jonathan Smith is going to put out there because I think uh, an eight- or nine-win season is very, very well within reach and could very honestly be uh, the expectation going into the year. I think that if they can just be better defensively, then that's more than an attainable goal for the bees. You know, I was talking about UCLA and USC earlier this week. They don't have to be elite. You know, Utah has had some amazing defenses. Cal is good on defense every year. That's kind of their calling card. Washington has been really, really good. And they need just a little bit more from the other side of the ball. But the, the Beavs are more in that UCLA USC camp where you have a great offense, you, you put up the points, you have a good offensive coach. The defense just needs to be a non liability. And, and I think that 
of those three teams, they all fall into that category of you don't need it to be, you know, top two or three in the Pac-12 like like Utah or Cal. You just need it to be solid enough and you let the offense carry you to wins. Speaking of the offense, by the way, let's let's talk about the spring game that they had uh, about a week and a half ago or so and, and some of the standouts in that game. Now, earlier this month, Oregon State lost Zariah Beeson to Washington State via the transfer portal. And so th- there's a little bit of a void there. Not a massive one, I would say, at the wide receiver position. But there's uh, perhaps an opportunity is a better way to put it for someone to kind of step up. And, and Silas Bolden might be somebody who could do that. Bolden's a guy that I'm looking forward to have a breakout season this year. He and Anthony Gould, I, I think, at wide receiver are the two guys who are really going to benefit from uh, the open spots there from guys like Trevon Bradford graduating, Zariah Beeson entering the transfer portal, Champ Flemings as well, transferring to Arkansas State. Those are three guys who have started in their careers. So, you know, you've got plenty of roles open for for guys to step into. And and Silas Bolden was one that that really stood out to me in the spring game as somebody who's ready to make that leap. Um, in, In the red zone lockout drill at the end of the spring game, Oregon State didn't really do a a game, so to speak. It was more of kind of a glorified practice. Um, so they did this red zone drill at the end of at the end of the practice, and Silas Bolden on both of his drives scored a 25 yard touchdown on the very first play. So I mean, that's a guy who's who's making explosive plays in the spring, who I think is going to carry that over uh, into fall camp and and you know potentially lock up a starting gig, uh, if not at least land very highly on on the two deep. Um, Anthony Gould being the other one that I mentioned there, he's someone who kind of broke out a little bit last year. He had a huge game early in the year. Um, I want to say against Hawaii, if I remember correctly, I think he, he received for about 110, 120 yards in that game, if I remember correctly. Um, and then he, you know, his, his production kind of tailed off as, as his playing time diminished, but he's someone who has ran a lot with the first team group this spring um, and you know has has a lot of momentum carrying over from last regular season. We've talked a lot about Oregon State's ability to run the ball, and they they've been very good at that, and should be again this year with, with the offensive line. But who who are those ball carriers supposed to be this year for Jonathan Smith? Well, Deshaun Fenwick comes back from last year's squad. You know he was kind of the primary backup to BJ Baylor, who had one of those Oregon State running back seasons. You know, it seems like every year it's, whether it's Jermar Jefferson, Artavis Pierce, I mean, you could go back to Jaquiz Rogers and and down the line. Seems like there's always one guy who's a threat to rush for a thousand plus, right? Uh, BJ Baylor had that year last year, um, but Fenwick was right there behind him and, you know, was was a great change of pace uh, to, to what Baylor brought. Trey Lowe is also back. He was kind of a third down specialist, got involved in the passing game a little bit as a receiver. Um, So I really like what he brings to the mix. But the guy who stood out among everybody else in spring camp, and and this is a guy guy who I've been high on since the moment I first saw him, uh, is true freshman Damian Martinez, who enrolled early at Oregon State. He came from, uh, from, oh man, I'm I'm blanking on the exact high school name right now, but a big school in Texas. So, you know, he's he's used to being in the spotlight a little bit. yeah, this is this is someone who can who can run away with the job very early in his career. He was far and away the most productive running back I saw throughout camp over the five weeks that that I watched practice. Um, and and in the spring game, I, I think you know fans kind of got their first look at him and and came away very impressed. So, Damian Martinez, one of the true freshmen in this conference, I think that's going to kind of take people by storm this year. Louisville, Texas is the uh, is, yep. is, is the one is the one that you're looking for. I, I I will be honest with you, Carter. I did Google that while while you were talking just now. Um, good though, my memory is it's not it's not that it's yeah, not that yeah. well. Actually, I don't have that great a memory. But anyway, so uh, let, let's go on the defensive side of of the ball. Who are some of the names that have popped out, particularly in the linebacking core for new defensive coordinator Trent Bray? Because there are a couple guys that you texted me about. Yeah, it's going to start with the inside linebackers this year, as as it has every year, as long as you know Jonathan Smith's been here. Um, Tim Tibisar before Trent Bray implemented this scheme that really relies on the inside linebackers to be 
at, at you know they need to be on the ball on every play. Um, that's why you saw Avery Roberts tackle total so high the last couple of years. Omar Spates in the first couple of years of his career um, has been right up there with the tackle leaders in the conference. So with Roberts gone, who do you turn to? I, I think it's two guys in particular being Kyrie Fisher and Easton Mascarenas, but more so the the former there in, in Fisher who stepped in a little bit last year um, and was kind of a primary backup and and had a couple of pretty good games towards the end of the year. Um, he's been with the first team group all spring and, and he's someone who I expect very late in his career now after transferring from Arkansas, um, to kind of finally flourish in, in a bigger role on the edge at, at outside linebacker, Andre Hughes Murray is gone after being at Oregon state for, man, he was another one of those six or seven year guys. Um, but Andrew Chatfield, who I mentioned earlier on, um, that's an, instant impact transfer coming in from sec territory he was a contributor at florida very early in his career i believe as a true freshman um so to, to bring somebody in with that kind of background bring him into the pac-12 and um you know put him on a roster that has struggled on the front seven i, I think he's somebody who could stand out as you know maybe one of the team mvps this year um they're they're certainly going to rely on him i i think he's going to be one of the primary sources of um, of pass rush on the other side. Um, John McCartan is back from injury. Ryan Frankie took a big step forward. Corey Stover's another young guy who I expect to get into the mix. So it's going to be a pretty big rotation. I, I would guess at, at linebacker, particularly on the outside. Looking ahead after spring football and, and Oregon state, I believe is done with, with, with spring football now. So you know, it's all it's it's speculation season, so so to speak, until we can you know get back to to fall camp beginning in in July or August or whenever whenever it, it picks back up again. Looking ahead for Oregon State, what do you think are the biggest storylines that that are coming out of Corvallis that that fans should be aware of in terms of you know what to look for on maybe a, a roster addition or names that you know, we'll, we'll start to get circulated in stories every now and then about, you know, oh yeah, this guy actually looked really good. Or they think that this is going to happen. Like, well, like what are, what are those sorts of places where Beaver fans should, should have their ears peeled? The first thing, and it's one of the first things we talked about, you know, today is can Oregon state bring somebody in to contribute on the defensive line this year? Can they scour the transfer portal and, and find someone who can come in and is immediately eligible um, and, and can step in and, and land on the two deep right away. That's the, that's the big missing piece on this team still. Um, I, I think if you're able to bring in a defensive tackle, um, you know, a big body, someone who can eat up a couple of blockers and, and open up some lanes for those talented outside linebackers, um, this defense could really take off, um, especially with the scheme that Trent Bray is going to bring in. So if Oregon State can do that, sky's the limit. But given the track record, I, I really question whether that's going to happen. Um, out, outside of that, on a, on a broader scale, I think they just need to start looking at the transfer portal in general, man. I mean, Oregon State's lost so many guys over the last couple of months to the portal, but hasn't brought anyone in really to speak of. Um, they did just land a former four-star recruit at running back who was at Georgia Tech um, in Jameis Griffin. Um, but I mean, he comes into a group that's already pretty deep. It, it wasn't in my mind, a position of need. So it, it was kind of a head scratcher at the time. Um, but you know, you constantly want to have an influx of talent coming from the transfer portal nowadays. Um, and, and for Oregon state, this is, you know, a, a program that's lost so much in the portal this year. Um, it's, it's kind of uncharacteristic. Cause I feel like when we talk about Jonathan Smith, we think of a guy who has really used the portal to his advantage the last couple of years. Um, bringing in the likes of Avery Roberts, Nathan Eldridge, Tristan Jebbia, um, and, and a handful of others. So that's something that I'm keeping an eye on, you know, as, as the coaches kind of transfer into the, um, into the recruiting side of things uh, at, at this part of the offseason is what are they looking for in the portal? It's not as if there's a shortage of names in, in the NCAA transfer portal these days. They're there's more than a few if you can find one who, who'd be interested. Finally, with Carter Bain, senior writer and editor at beaverblitz.com. One of the big pieces of news in the offseason for Oregon State, something that I'm sure most Beaver fans will agree, was, was 
it, it was time to to get rid of Reese's Stadium and you know go with the the tear down and 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 build something newer and and better. What's kind of the latest on the on the construction front, and is that you know generating any, any excitement among students that that you can discern in terms of oh we're gonna we're gonna have a new place to go this fall? Where by the way, Oregon State, correct me if I'm wrong, did not lose a season ago. Yep, six and zero at Reeser last year, which uh, was a, a very fitting way to to send the West Grandstand out. You know, they they closed it on a high note, beat Utah at home too, which was I, I think one of the better wins by a Pac-12 team last year, um, rivaling you know of course Oregon winning at the Horseshoe. Um, <laughs> yeah. But no, it it definitely was time, as you mentioned. You know, they were approaching this; it, they were kind of at a crossroads where they said, "All right." It's going to be this expensive to to upgrade it, you know, to seismic standards and whatnot, and you know, make it more accessible. Or it's going to be this much money to tear it all down and and start fresh. And you know, I, I think the choice was very obvious. You know, it was time. Let's just gut it and and start over. Um, and that's what they've done. And they've made a ton of progress over the last couple of months. And I'll tell you what, it has really excited the fan base. It's really excited the university. Um, I, I drive by the the construction site every now and then just to you know check out and see the the progress they've made. I know when I was going to practice, you know, I was seeing it a couple of days a week, and it seemed like every day, you know, something new was going up, more concrete was being poured. Um, but yeah, that's that's a project that'll be done ahead of the 2023 season. So going into this year, uh, Research Stadium will be at a capacity of somewhere in the realm of 25,000. Um, it'll be at about half capacity. So I would expect pretty much all of their home games will probably be sold out, um, which will be interesting because you'll have fans on one side of the stadium and in the end zones, but nothing on the other side. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see how that looks, uh, but I'm, I'm certainly more excited to see it about a year and a half from now when it's all complete. And I, I think at that point, Oregon State would have arguably one of the nicest football stadiums out West, if, if not in college football. I mean, if, you know, not a single part of that stadium will be older than like 20 years at that point when it's all said and done. So that's something to look forward to. And, and also a, a new piece that just came out, Oregon State's getting a new video board this year too. And that will actually be ready for this season. So um, a big time upgrade there. It's going to be like twice the size of the old one. Um, I don't think it's quite as big as the one that Oregon just installed, but um, definitely a sign of, you know, Oregon State investing in football and kind of getting with the times a little bit, um, investing in technology, investing in premium seating and, and you know, giving Jonathan Smith a vote of confidence saying, hey, we're, we're going to put money into this program. Yeah, and I think that stuff matters more than people realize from, from a recruiting standpoint. It does, but also from the level of, of fan engagement that, that you're going to get, the you know, the way fans come to the stadium, the way they feel about going to the stadium, there's always going to be a nostalgic factor for, for the old Reeser Stadium. But you and I are both wearing Mariners gear right now. The Mariners are better off because they play at Safeco Field. I'm sorry, T-Mobile, but no. The Mariners are better off because they play at Safeco Field. The Kingdom, sure, there are some wonderful, wonderful memories there for, for Seattle's beloved Mariners, but they're better off playing at, at Safeco Field because it's a brand new, beautiful ballpark, and they had the All Star Game there. And I, I think it does help with a, a number of things when you're looking at, at a football program, and you have to have that sort of investment, right? Because that money is going to come from, it, yes, revenue from the football program, but mostly from you know, you know donors or the school, and, and you have to have that sort of commitment. And I just think from a broad Pac-12 perspective. It's good to see a school like Oregon State making that sort of investment in football, because I think we've seen a lot of schools over the years not go all in on, on their facilities and recruiting has waned as a result. My mind always jumps to Colorado, by the way, who I'm talking about tomorrow here on Locked On Pac-12. Subscribe wherever you're listening to and or watching the show and thank you in advance for doing so. But Colorado could have retained Mel Tucker, who just went 11 and two at Michigan State, but they didn't want to pay the money like, like that's. That's how on a conference level you have teams fall all the way down when you have schools that are not as committed to athletics as we as fans would like them to be. And then as a result, you fall behind because if you're not doing, you know, it's if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. If you're staying the same, you're falling behind everybody else. And I think it's 
Oregon State fans were very concerned about the athletic department's uh, ability and commitment to funding football up until this project was announced. Um, it, it, it was something the Research Stadium project has been, you know, brought up by fans on, you know, on our message board at beaverblitz.com and and on Twitter and you name it for years. Um, and I think it reached a tipping point a couple of years ago where fans were like, man, like, does our athletic department just not care? Um, you know, like, why is no money being put into football right now? Why is our marketing dropping? Um, why is attendance waning? You know, there were all these concerns. And then a year and a half ago or so, this research stadium project is announced and immediately it's like a, a switch flipped. It, it seems like Oregon State started winning. Um, the fan base really got itself rejuvenated. Um, and now you actually have tangible proof that the athletic department is like, all right, yep, football, we're all in. Um, that's that's huge because in today's day and age, you know, football drives all. Football is the reason Oregon State has the money to field one of the best baseball teams in the country on a year in and year out basis. It's the reason it has a very successful women's basketball program. Um, it's the reason it has a gymnastics program that is consistently in the top 25, you know, like having that consistent investment in football, um, it, it goes so far beyond football. And I think it's, it's a great sign to see Oregon state really, um, start to fully dive into that a little bit. Yeah. Football is, is King in America, as they say. And if, if you ever need evidence of that, just Google some financials of college athletics and how, how that all breaks down and, and you will see it. Carter Baines is his name. He's a senior editor and writer at beaverblitz.com. This was his first appearance on Locked On Pac-12. I can assure you it won't be the last because anytime we've got Oregon State news, Carter, I'm going to turn right back to you, my guy. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate everybody listening to and watching the show and have a wonderful rest of your day.